Welcome to If These Ovaries Could Talk, the Queer Families Podcast. I'm Jamie, and I'm your host. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Thank you for making this show a possibility. Oh, thank you so much, BetterHelp. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's Jamie here, and I'm solo. This is my first show without Robin. Oh, man. And it's so bittersweet. I miss her. I miss her already, and I know you do too. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I have been, I have been procrastinating recording this episode and I'm sure my editor has been like where's the file I need the file so sorry Steph so sorry <laughs> but it's here it's like almost midnight and I'm finally recording it at night and my dog is bouncing around but here I am and I have been procrastinating because I it's it's scary to do this without Robin I miss Robin and I I know you guys do too um but I am also really excited about the episode that you're about to hear because Here's the thing. With Robin's leaving, I have had a lot of really low lows, as you can imagine, trying to figure out how I'm going to keep this afloat and what I'm going to do. But also I've had some high highs um, because, you know, we've been doing this show for almost five years and it's been time for a change, to be quite honest. It's, it, and now that Robin has left, it's given me a little bit of breath to like take a step back and look at the show and see what we've been missing this whole time. And, and, and we have been missing some things. You know, when we started this show five years ago, I had no idea. We had no idea it was going to take off the way it did. I just knew I wanted to hear this podcast and I couldn't believe it didn't exist. And I went to the one person I could think of who I saw once a year who I knew was also a performer and said, you want to do this with me? And she was like, yeah. You know, we had no idea it was actually going to go anywhere. Um, and so, you know, and then the world has changed since we started it. A lot of stuff has, has taken place. Black Lives Matter. We have attacks on trans folks, trans youth, tra like, all kinds of stuff has been happening in the world since we started this podcast. And in the vein of inclusion and representation, which we say all the time, representation matters, it has always sat uneasy with me that we were two white cis lesbians at the helm as hosts of this show. And yes, we brought in as much diversity as we could, and we brought in as many facets of our community as we could find, but it was still two white cis lesbians leading the charge. And it always sat a little bit uneasy with me. And I'm not saying I am, I miss Robin immensely. And I don't want Robin to be gone. And I, I am extremely sad she's gone. But it's giving me the opportunity to change it up a bit, diversify, add a little representation to our host table. And so that's why I'm really, really excited to bring you this episode today. Because uh, this person, E, kind of came across my desk when this whole switch up happened, this whole transition started happening, and E was really excited to be on the podcast. And then I was talking with E more and more, and then E was really excited to possibly come in and finish out the season with me as a host. And I'm, I'm really excited to share E's story with you. Um, this episode is chock full of new topics, not new topics, but we go deep into some topics that we haven't gotten deep into before. E recently came out as non-binary, as a 47-year-old, um, and is really open and honest about their journey with that, and we go into that in this episode. And, oh, there's my dog, sorry. Also, you know, many of you through the years have reached out to us asking for more non-bio parent stories, especially non-bio parent stories where folks are having a hard time with the whole non-bio parent thing. And it happened to me. I had a hard time. And it also happened to E. And we go deep into that too, which is really excited. Um, we also go really deep into E's divorce story. And it was not the cleanest of divorces. So 
it's not all unicorns and rainbows. Um, and I think you're going to love E's story. And I think you're going to love E as much as I do. And I'm so excited to bring to you the new Ovaries 2.0 and where we're going to go with it. The sky's the limit. Representation matters. Inclusion matters. And I am really excited to try to include everyone in our beautiful, beautiful, vast, and varied rainbow of a community. Yes, I said rainbow there. Yes, I hear Robin making fun of me right now. So anyway, okay, without further ado, Helen, I know. I know I've gone way over. She's still, she's still bugging me. She's still stuck with me, guys. She won't leave me alone. She's, I, Helen, okay, fine. Helen, roll the tape, please. Roll the tape, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Hi, E. Hi, Jamie. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am great. I woke up winning. You guys, I'm so excited that E is here to talk to us and, and share their story and just be a light in the tunnel for me. I'm so happy to be talking with you, E. And one thing that E does, before we get into everything, E has a whole social media channel that's called Woke Up Winning. The whole reasoning for it is, is that basically if you woke up today, you woke up winning. You're alive. We're here. We're winning. And we're going to make the most of our day. Am I right? Or did I butcher it completely? You got it completely right. And sometimes we wake up winning and it's trash. It's a trash <laughs> day. But we still won, right? Because we woke up. Because we can alive. fix it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I love it. And I've been saying it ever since I met you. I've been saying oh, it to myself. Yay. And woke up winning. Woke up. Uh, this morning I did it. I was, <laughs> had a rough waking up. I said, I woke up winning. I woke up winning. Yep. So E, we have to hear your elevator story before we do anything else. Okay. I'm going to put up a timer. Don't be scared. I won't cut you off. But I want to do it right. Of course you do. Everybody wants to. And everybody does. That's the beauty of this. Okay. So on your mark, get set. Hi, my name is E. Bradshaw. I am 47-year-old Black queer human being. I have a son who's 11. I am a director, actor, a theater professional. I love what I get to do. I'm excited to be here. I was, uh, uh, oh God, pressure. Now I see the clock. What else am I supposed to say? I own a business. I, I love life. I wake up winning and the timer, I'm just looking at it and I feel pressure <laughs> and I don't have anything else to say. That's good. That was perfect, E. You got it. So E, I loved it. You got everything in. And I also know that you recently came out as non-binary. Yes, I did come out as non-binary. I guess come out or just discover. Yeah, I don't know what the right term, maybe somebody yeah. at home, I'm sure. Somebody at home knows the, the best way to say it. But um, I mean, you have been gay for a very long time. I have been the gayest <laughs> for a very long time. I, I was gay at 13. Okay, it was summer uh -oh. camp, Camp uh -oh. Kayamisha. Uh-oh. And her name was Ginger. And she protected me from the, the boys because boys back then, they just farted on you and they mm. hit you in the head and mm -hmm. they ran off. And she stood up for me and protected me and walked me to the bathroom. And she was like a hero. She was and everything. Was, Everything. And so I went home from camp and I would pretend she was there. And I was like, oh, Ginger, I'll go make <laughs> dinner and you take care of the children. And I was like, oh, that's gay. I've been gay clearly since I was 13, making imaginary love to my camp friend. <laughs> but I love that it was. But I really love that it was. <laughs> Oh, Ginger, I'll cook dinner. You take care of the children. Like, <laughs> Yeah, these heteronormative practices are oh deep, God. deeply embedded in, in but, us. But, you know, but you foreshadowed a little bit because you did actually have a kid and, you know, you yeah. make dinner for a spouse. I know you do. I do. I so. do. I do. But it's thanks to the L word that I learned how to be a lesbian <laughs> because I'm not joking. Sadly, JB, I'm not joking. Who, who was your? I was bet. Right. Uh, Bet's my favorite. I think I'm Bet, but I'm probably a little Bet Alice. Alice is cool. Alice is yeah. cool. See, I think so, but the combo of those. Mm. But I didn't realize perhaps you shouldn't live your life like Bet lived. You know what I mean? Perhaps. She's not a good person, is she? I mean, I think she tries, <sighs> she but does. I didn't know the rules for lesbianism. Right. Right. Like there's there's rules in everything or boundaries. I didn't understand boundaries for lesbians the same way I understood boundaries for heterosexuals. Like heterosexuals, probably, you know, the males and females don't hang out together, right? Because there's some attraction. Right. 
sometimes there's right. attraction between two women who are lesbians and you have to identify it and say, whoa, we got to step back, even though we're both women and we're friends. But I didn't right. know. I didn't. I, I just didn't this. know. Yeah. And it, yeah. it Jersey was crazy. The 90s, the early 2000s, it was nuts. So I learned from the L word and then I had to unlearn the L word. Right. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a long journey to yeah. to this point because I never felt with my gender identity. I never felt boy. I never felt girl. I just felt this otherness. Yeah. But I didn't know I had an option. So now these young people these days, they say you have options. You can be non-binary. I didn't know I was non-binary until the words I was listening to what everybody was talking about. And I've, I was fascinated with gender and gender identity. And I've always felt a duality inside of myself. I just felt like it was just me being queer. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. And then somebody said this word non-binary and they said it, but they didn't change how they looked. They just said mm-hmm. I'm non-binary. And it hit me that, oh, I don't have to look like a thing. I can just use the words that fit me without having to fit into the words. Right. Right. And so I heard non-binary and they were like, yeah, it's when you don't feel like a girl or a boy or a male or female. You just feel like non-binary. Like there's some other, there's other words on the spectrum that haven't been found or used. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, that's it. That's it. Because I haven't felt either way completely. Yeah. A lot of my earlier life, I decided I have a female body. Obviously, I have to dress towards that because I was so much heavier. I didn't look good in men's clothes. I didn't look good (laughs) without like, but I looked really good when I put on the things, the makeup and the dress. And I'm an actor and I'm a good actor. So I was like, I can act femme. I can act like a a girl because that's what my body said. You mask so well. Yes. And so I was mad. I was carrying purses and I was like, (laughs) yes. And I'm an actor. I got to act it. And then I realized it was so much work. Mm. And I'm like, oh, you're acting in your private life to try to act like what you think a woman or a girl is. Why don't you stop? And then I was like, so obviously I'm transgendered and I want to be a man. And I was like, ready. I was about to start taking tea. And I was like, but I don't really believe in myself as a man. Mm. Like I didn't, I don't feel like a man in, it could be antiquated, but my understanding of manhood or to be a black man is not something I really want. (laughs) <laughs> so, right. or that I, I feel like the technology in the medical realm is not enough to get me where I would want to be if I wanted to be a man. Right. And, and then I told my wife, I was like, what if I start taking tea? Cause I really want a beard and I really do would love a, a beard. A beard. Okay. But she said to me, think about your family history. Are the men in your family hairy? And none of them can grow a damn beard. Are you kidding? I really, no, I'm not. And I was like, if I take tea just to get a damn beard. And you don't get and, one. And I don't get a beard or I get little tufts of hair that stick. <laughs> I would be mad as hell. I'll say this. If I started taking tea, I would be the hairiest man you ever met. <laughs> See, I love that. My wife is hairy, too. And I say that with love because I like hair. I want arm hair. Like, I don't have arm hair. I don't have hair. I'm jealous. I want lack of hair. But it's, you know, like, that's the thing. To each their own, right? To each right, their own. Right. And we all feel very differently in these bodies that we were given. Yeah. And if I'm going to take tea, I want to be a bearded, hairy. I want to be Robin Williams. You know what I'm saying? I want that. Them. <laughs> and I was talking to doctors and, and they're like, Robin it really follows. <laughs> I know. I understand what I just said. But... <laughs> But I love all that hair. I just like it. I'm, I like hair. Yeah. I was talking to the doctor. He's like, it's going to follow your genetic pattern. If your mom and dad were are not people who produce hair and your family's not hairy, the likelihood is the tea will do other things. Of course, it's going to change this. But I like my face. Like, right. I like the way things are set up. <laughs> and if that's the main reason I'm taking tea, that's probably yeah. not a good reason to take right. tea. So I'm going to get a beard made. I think. If it makes you feel good, if it makes you feel, it's like yeah. accessorizing yourself to make yourself feel more like myself at, home. at yeah. times, you know, right. there's some times where I feel like I, there's a character on this show called P Valley. His name is Uncle Clifford and he has a beard, but he wears makeup and feminine fashionable clothes, but he doesn't try to look like a 
woman or a man. He just puts on what he wants to put on and he happens to be able to grow a full beard. And it works. It's, I think it's very attractive, the duality. I when men too. I can think feel like they great. can wear skirts and yeah. women can wear and have facial hair and be be who we are instead of plucking and tweezing everything off. And yeah. I mean, I still do my eyebrows because I think that's important. Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's your expression. That's your, that's your, my you're, expression. You're an actor. You need those eyebrows. Yes. And this is representation because you just figured out that you are non-binary at, at the age of what? 40, 47. 47. So it's been a year that I've been really in it. And I started off with they, them, she, because I was scared. Uh-huh. I was like, oh gosh, people are going to say she anyway, right? Because you look at me and that's what I know it, it comes off as. And I'm like, oh gosh, now I got to correct people. And then they're like, Erica, 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 my legal name. And I'm like, just E. But I was called E when I was a kid. So it fits. So yeah. it fit. The E fits, yeah. But it's been a challenge. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing too, because... You know, I have definitely slipped up when speaking to non-binary folks, accidentally said she or he, and then, oh, sorry, sorry, I meant they. You know, and then, you know, they say, don't make a huge deal out of it. Just just fix your mistake and move on. But when it's from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about, like, what it's like being in your shoes when you get misgendered? Here's what happens. So someone will say, and here's E and she, and I'm like, oh, was I supposed to? Am I supposed to correct them? I know they made a mistake. I know they're trying to. I just called myself she yesterday. Like, (laughs) oh God, I just, okay, I'm going to have great. I just have a lot of grace with myself because Mm -hmm. I still say she about me because I've been doing it for 46 and some change years. Like it's going to take time. So for people, especially who've known me or this is a big cultural shift. So I have a lot of grace with it, but I also understand people who don't. Mm-hmm. who need to be gendered right now correctly because of their own experience. So I don't mm-hmm. put my way on anybody else. This is just me, E. If you say she, I'm not going to like jump through the camera and be like, Jenny! Ah! <laughs> I'm not going to do that because it takes time. Now, when I'm 60 and if people are still saying she, then we'll we'll work on it. But people go, you know, especially young people now, because I'm in an age, mm-hmm. who knew? And there's this ma'am and sir shit that's been happening. Oh. And I'm like, no, ma'am. There's no miss in my students. I'm like, it's not Miss E. It's not mystery. It's just E. And they're like, uh, because we've totally messed their brains up. Because everything is in the binary. Yeah. I've been trying my new thing and I'm not, I'm failing miserably at it. But my new thing is to, is to try to get rid of the binary in my conversation altogether as much as I can. And I, I catch myself every once in a while. Other times I'm like, well, this is impossible. I can't do it. I have, to, I, have to, I have to use a binary term here. But I'm trying to like catch myself every t- I'm just trying to notice our language. I'm trying to notice how arbitrarily binary we have made everything. And everything. it's not necessary. It really nope. isn't. But it also is hard because my son, who is uh, just turned 11 on the 8th, He's like, do I call you mom, dad? Because <laughs> uh, this is new for him. It's new-ish. I've right. always talked out loud about queerness, about my feelings inside that not feeling like a girl, not feeling like a boy. I call myself the king queen of the house. Um, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but I'm the king. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're the prince if you want to. You could be prince, princess. You could be prince. But there's only one queen and a king queen. And the queen is my wife. I'm the king queen. And he gets to be whatever he wants to be. You just so it's make been it up. A, yeah. I make it up. Yeah. But he even asks, he's like, okay, it's they, not she. And he gets frustrated and I stop him. And recently I've had to stop making a joke over it because we, it's funny at first, right? Like right. they, them, it, what are you? I don't know. Right. But um, I'm starting to realize I have to stop joking about it. Because it's not a joke. Because it's not a joke. But that was my way of dealing with it because it's such a huge change. And for me, I never felt like I came out the closet as gay. I was just, I feel like I've always been so gay. And when I talked to my family or friends, they were like, well, it's a phase. My cousins were like, we all had these phases where we were eating pussy. And I'm like, what? 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 I didn't know. Can I say that? Can I say eating pussy? Yes, you can say that. Why am I whispering eating pussy? (laughs) Like, I 
didn't know this is a phase my family was going through. So everybody <laughs> went through this eating pussy phase and nobody I, told me. I've never heard of the eating pussy it's phase. Right. <laughs> But I kept going to family members, my aunt, my uncle, oh my, my cousins. They're like, it's a phase. We've all been go. through that phase. <laughs> but my family has been really, I was the firstborn grandchild. I was completely the first, you know, of everything. And the baby that was held up like Simba when I got mm-hmm. in town. And so I was completely spoiled until I left the house and realized, oh, I'm black and female. And then the world was like, bow. And right. I was like, but wait, I'm special. Remember? That's a <laughs> so, reckoning. That's a rude awakening. Yeah. That yeah. it was. It it has been. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, you guys, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and um, digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, and overeating. I think I do all of them. <laughs> I am stressed. I feel like I'm stressed all the time. I don't know about you guys. I'm stressed about the construction that is happening out of my window right now that you all can probably hear. I get stressed about the siren that just ran by because I think it just showed up in my recording. (laughs) I'm stressed about keeping this little podcast afloat. But when I'm stressed, I lose sleep. I eat more. I drink more. I mean, it's it's a mess. Um, And stress really shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, which I do that too, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, do less, and maybe try some therapy. I love BetterHelp. You know I love BetterHelp. My therapist with BetterHelp helps me just talk through things, and I appreciate them so much. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can lower your stress. And if these Ovaries Could Talk listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash O-C-T. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash O-C-T. Go get that help. Go get rid of that stress. Well, let's, let's talk about the family you created. How did you make your family? We're on a podcast all about queer families. How did I make my queer family? Uh, well, a little salt, a little pepper, a little... No, it's <laughs> jerky. <laughs> no, it was Lowry's. It, it was Lowry's. <laughs> yes, it was sperm. So my, ex, <laughs> my ex-wife <laughs> and I met, I think, 2007. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, a very fast lesbian courtship. As you Within do. Within three to you six months. It? Yep. We were living together. And six months after that, we had bought a house in oh. Jersey. Uh, wow. So, yeah. You're not we the planning. first queer person I have talked to who has said, we met, then six months later, we bought a house. Like, this is a thing. This is a thing in our community, apparently. It is a thing. Some people know. <laughs> yeah. Right away. And they just want to move ahead. And my ex-wife and I were at, I think we were around our 34, 35, and we're like, it's time to marry. And there was so there was nobody eligible, like nobody around that. People didn't have jobs. They were crazy. They were still married or they were straight and they wanted to dibble and dabble. So she was the first like woman I met at the time who had all of her shit together. She had her uh-huh. own apartment. She had her own credit card. She didn't, you know, like we were equally yoked mm-hmm. and we were like, we're going to have a family. And for me, I wanted the white American dream. That's what I was always going after. Yeah. Like, why can't I have the two, the house, the two cars and the kid and we moved my mom in downstairs it was a mother daughter style house and you know we're two girls who had dysfunctional upbringings Mm -hmm. and here we are successful we've broken our family issues whatever and we have means and we have all the things to look good we looked really good together we took great pictures we were stylish we went on trips we renovated kitchens but we didn't really know each other and like each other and care about each other in the way that we should have to maintain a long-term marriage. Yeah. And then we decided at one point to try to have a kid. And (laughs) here's something I recommend never doing. (laughs) We went back and forth. One month she would try. One month I would try. One month she would try. Two, every two months we would take a break. Then we would, yeah. So we were spending like- Question, why why did you guys decide to do it that way? Were both of you, did both of you really, really want to carry? Or- I wanted her to carry more. She was kind of like, eh. Whoever, but I was 
I was told at 23 I couldn't have any kids because they diagnosed me with infertility, mm. but I was PCOS. Mm. So at 23, I thought I couldn't have a kid and it was devastating to me because yeah. I always wanted to carry a baby. And so my mental health wasn't aware enough to say, I need to be the focus. Let's just make it about me. I'm yeah. sure she would have been fine with that, but I didn't have that self-awareness. So we went back and forth, back and forth. And then the last time we were like, okay, this is $20,000 in semen because we did IUI, which I would never do again. I would go right to IVF. Right. It's so expensive to do IUI. And, it's so, and we didn't do drugs because we were like, oh, yeah, it's just going to happen. It's just yeah, gonna we're happen. like, no, we're healthy. And just all we need is some little bit of what, one cc of $1,200 semen. Boom. And it'll work. <laughs> right there. And it needs to be. <laughs> right there. <laughs> but, you know, and some insurances are all different. So some like my insurance paid for IUIs, but not for IU, IVFs. Oh, wow. And you use donor sperm? We did. We from went a, through. Like from a bank? California, was it? No, it was Fairfax, Fairfax Cryobank. Cryobank. Mm-hmm. Fairfax Cryobank. Mm-hmm. And um, we still have some in storage, I think. Oh, you do? Yeah, so she and I have some, uh, That's some semen in storage in case either of us want to have a sibling. Yeah. Because they are only giving the donor we have as a sibling. Yes. Because um, he's You know, he's, when they get, he's um, used up, basically. He's retired, he has, is what they he's say. Reti- thank you. He's yes. retired. Not they used say, up. we have retired. Yeah. <laughs> He's retired from the system, but He's if retired. you come back and ask, you can buy him back. But that means you've been paying for storage all this time. Yeah. 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 And my son is 11. Yeah. So this was before. So then my ex-wife got pregnant and I was decimated. And I think, honestly, this is probably one of those moments that's hard to admit, but it was one of the major steps to the downfall of our marriage was that when she got pregnant, I lost my mind. Like right. I experienced feelings of jealousy mm. and resentment mm-hmm. that I couldn't fathom. I couldn't even understand. And then I went scouring the internet. People who hate their wives or are jealous of their wives when they're pregnant or resent their wives because they got pregnant and the other one, and there was nothing no, there. That's why that's why we had to create this podcast here. Cause yeah. it's not out there. It's nothing out there. And E I am the same. I had issues when my wife got pregnant, even though we had decided she's going to go first because she's older. I had major issues. I mean, I was really afraid that I was afraid that I wasn't going to bond with the baby. I mean, I don't want to put like I want to hear your feelings, but you're not alone. And we have heard from people, too, who write into us asking, can we have more non-bio mom stories because I'm having a hard time? You know, so the worst. It was some, it was some of us really have a hard time with it. Not everyone, but some of us. Right. Do. And I had a hard time 11 years ago or 12 years ago. And there was nothing yeah. out there. Yeah. There were once in a while stories that I would find from men who were like, I'm so jealous because this baby is going to take my focus and my wife is not my wife anymore. Right. But That's it was different, different to, to look at this person that I knew at some point I was in love with. And now I can't even stand her face. Because it felt like she stole something from me. Mm. And so then, you know, we went through the pregnancy, which I was just, I was a horrible, horrible mate in the sense of, I was great about, like, I took the pictures every week. I set us up to go and take the big, you're here, we hold the belly. Oh, you did the the special shots, yeah. The special shot. But I was, I made the mistake of telling her that I was jealous. Mm. And so she shut down. And all I wanted was information about every day. How do you feel? What is going on in your body? And she thought that that would make me more jealous. So she stopped talking and I felt more left out than ever Mm. because I'm watching her grow our human. And, you know, I'm buying maternity clothes. I'm doing the stuff because I'm a taskmaster. I do Mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't. I wasn't pregnant. And it it even talking about it now, I wanted it so bad. Mm. And I wasn't honest with myself. I wasn't honest with her. And then she got this experience and our beautiful little baby boy was born. Right. And I was in love, but I was like, we were both mother bears because she's having this bio connection. Like I have to pump and I, and I'm mad about that. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, but I'm home all day. I gave up my whole acting career to be with the baby. And first of all, I should have never done that. By the way, <laughs> because the resentment that that called, that was way before the baby. We bought a house and two weeks later I was gone to do a regional theater piece somewhere. Mm-hmm. 
And my ex-wife asked me, she said, can you stay home for a while? And, you know, as an actor, when you make that decision to stay home, the momentum went from every, I was booked every month, book, book, book. The momentum went. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. And I ended up getting TV. I did Law and Order for like five years. I mean, you're like a famous, you're like a famous actor. So there's no, I'm not. I'm not a famous actor. You've done very well. (laughs) The acting thing is a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But then the baby got here. We were worse. We were just worse. I realized we had really different parenting styles. She's very strict. Well, I need to be very stern with hers. And then I, after my son was about a year, we decided to try again. Except this time we were going to use Clomid. Mm-hmm. Now, let me tell you something about Clomid. You know about Clomid. I know about Clomid. Me with undiagnosed mental health issues, mm. Clomid, <laughs> and wanting to be pregnant so bad. Ah, oh, it was a disaster. Were you that emotional? Drug, I was beyond emotional. I was having phantom pregnancy. So after we did an ins- the last insemination where I was a nightmare, I was like screaming and yelling in the car. Like I was, I acknowledged that I was a beast. The Clomid <laughs> made me a beast even more, right? And um, uh-huh. I got inseminated and I, this is hard to talk about because I make jokes about a lot of things to handle, but this one is, um, I thought I was pregnant. And I took 26 pregnancy tests in the bathroom at Panera Bread because I didn't want my wife at the time to see that I was crazy. And I was so sure I was pregnant that I just got a bunch of different tests. Yeah. And I was like peeing a stick. And I was like, but I know I'm pregnant. I feel it. I feel it. And, you know, your brain is powerful. And I was not pregnant. No. And you think the Clomid had something to do with that? I think because I had PTSD and I I had a, a bunch of issues, mental health stuff. Right. And I think. On top of that, putting the Clomid and not being in psychiatric care or psychological care, or, we weren't doing the therapeutic things mm-hmm. that we know we should have been doing, considering our, both of our backgrounds of trauma. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. I lost it. I just didn't want to be there. I was started running. <laughs> and so I was just running literally away from my house. Wow. And I was asking my wife for help, my wife at the time for help. She didn't know how to. She had her own mental health stuff going on and postpartum. And eventually it got really bad between the two of us. And I had an affair and left. You know, I predicted the affair. I said, this is what's going to happen. I need help. But um, we couldn't navigate it. And that leaving while hard, it has been hard co-parenting and just that whole thing. It yeah. helped me to get my, I got my mind right. Hmm. I took care of my mental health. I realized that, you know, a life full of the traumas that I've been through, I have to deal with it and I needed medication to do it. Mm-hmm. So it did help me get healthier, but now I'm in a co-parenting situation. I've been divorced since 2014. I'm remarried in 2020 and I'm a different human being. But I'm still dealing with the remnants of a failed marriage and yeah. a co-parenting situation that. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. How, how Ooh, did, things, did things improve? Uh, she's very mad at me. Oh, she's very mad at me. And because I get it. Everything that went down. Everything that went down. And I get it. I've done my apology to her. But sometimes people are just going to be mad at you. Mm-hmm. It's hard. We don't speak. We use an app called Our Family Wizard, <laughs> which I'm not even trying to do a promo, but we can't communicate via email or text mm. because it's it's contentious. It's so it's so hard. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. At the same time, we have this kid who is like he's gifted and talented. He, like he's straight A's. Excuse me. He got a B plus. He told me. It's not a straight A this time, mom, but I'm going to get it by the end of the year. Don't worry. And I'm not worried at all. I never got A's in my program. (laughs) Like, I'm like, wow, this kid is, he's an amazing human being. Like, he's kind. He's empathetic. He's a cute kid, but he's more beautiful inside than he is as a cute kid on the outside. Right. So somehow, even with all of our bullshit, we've managed to keep keep it away from him enough that he's like, I have four, because she's remarried. Mm-hmm. He's like, I have four amazing moms. So you, but so you have a big, you ended up with this nice sized family unit that might not be the ideal situation. It might not be the traditional, even um, bigger family unit, but it works. It's working because your son is. I guess it is. A beautiful human being. 
He is. And he said to me, he said, you know, I know you guys don't get around along, but look at me. I'm great. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, I mean, he's but great. He's not phased by it. And I mean, even though she and I have a really non-communicative sans app relationship, I love her. I will. All, I mean, that's the mother of my kid, right? How do you not? We just don't get along. And I'm not surprised. I hurt yeah. her and she hurt me and we haven't. Heal. consciously uncoupled like Gwyneth because we aren't millionaires. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just we're raising a great kid. Yeah. It's been a it's been an interesting family making journey. I think we're all family, but I don't think she sees it that way at all because a woman scorned man. Let me tell you something. It's the truth. It's no joke. Yeah. yeah. It's no joke when a woman feels like she's been scorned for no good reason and that you know, I never made amends. That mm. was the big word. You need to make amends. And I'm like, oh, what is that? What do you mean? Like, I think for a long time it was come back. Mm. If that, that was the amends, like work to get me back. And I didn't do that. And you didn't do that. You didn't want to do You couldn't do that. I could not do that. I was in so much pain and I needed help. And mm. so the person that I left my wife for who happened to be a family friend, it was a big mess, right? Uh, was a soft space for me to land. And I needed that because I was so, I was so messed up. Yeah. And my ex-wife didn't know how to, and not her fault, right? I got more messed up and she just beelined out of there. Hmm. We didn't know how to deal with mental health issues at all. Um, so I know it's hard for her and I try to have empathy, but you know, I'm it's like, hard. can we stay out of court now? Can that I not give nice. all, can we save the money that we're giving these attorneys? Our divorce was like an $80,000 divorce. We both ended up having to go bankrupt. Oh, like it, it's, yeah, because if you don't deal with the feelings, the financial will crumble everything. Because a marriage is a business. Yeah. And we had cars, right. we had a house, we had stuff. And the emotional made us treat the business as if it wasn't a business. Mm. Interesting. So, I've never heard somebody say marriage is a business, but you're right. It is. And you have to be on the same page and you have to, you got to manage it. You have to manage yeah. it. It needs managing. Especially if you're owning stuff together and you're paying bills together. And at one point I left the house. I was just like, take the house because we bought it before we were married. So her name was on it for the mortgage because she had the better credit. And she was like, we'll put you on the deed later. It never happened. Right. There's right. pensions to deal with. And there's like, we were in there we were connected we were yeah. connected and it hurt because it's a ripping apart mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a, a unit that you stitch together mm -hmm. and we didn't do it we didn't do a good job mm -hmm. in separating it well i think it's important that you tell this story because honestly like we haven't had that many people on the show that that have been divorced we have had folks who have been divorced for sure but you know it doesn't always end up like sunshine and rainbows and it doesn't always it <laughs> unicorns a lot of the time it's not a lot of unicorns it's really ugly and that's the mm -hmm. shit that's that's the shit that is the but shit. you're carrying on and you're you're raising this beautiful human being and you're doing something mm -hmm. right which is yeah which is great because we need more good boys out there in the world that's for right sure. you know what's funny too my my ex and i were plaintiffs against the state of new jersey for marriage equality Ooh. so so we were the only black lesbian couple against the state of New Jersey for marriage equality. And we won. This is before the federal took place. Mm -hmm. So we won. And I have like commendations around from the state. For you. Being, Thank you and your family for uh, participating and fighting for justice. That's amazing. And then there was a book that we're in. And I tried to. But this all happened after we divorced. Like it mm -hmm. all. The court case happened before. We won, we won marriage equality while we were still married. And then afterwards we started getting these commendations people want us to come talk we were on the cover of lambda legal <laughs> oh no. and then but you and were now, together <laughs> and, now we're oh. and it's just like i wish that we would have talked more about what would divorce look like that's my advice to everybody getting married right whether right. you're straight gay binary non-binary talk about how the divorce is going to look mm -hmm. put things in place and i know this may sound horrible but put things in place as if it's not going to work mm -hmm. and go through it like how does it look how would a divorce look mm -hmm. not that you're planning for it or you want it 
But just so you protect yourself. So one thing my ex did that protected us that I'm thinking that she's mad about now. She made sure we had a second parent adoption. Mm -hmm. So my son was three, but we were civil unions. But remember, civil union wasn't the same as marriage. Mm -hmm. She made sure at three months old, we were at the courthouse. Second parent adoption was done. Yes. And I was mad about it. I was like, I don't want to have to do this. I'm the, I even put the sperm I, in there. I ah, made ah, this ah, baby. Yeah. I, I made this baby. <laughs> yeah. It took and, us forever to get it done. Ours didn't get finished till like last year, which is. Oh, wow. Not okay. <laughs> it took a while. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot. It's a yeah. lot. So I'm grateful because if that hadn't have been the case, I wouldn't have had the rights to my oh. son in the same way during the divorce. And if it gets ugly. You, honey, protect anybody, lesbians, non-lesbians, gay people out there, people who want children, protect yourself Yeah. in the event of something going askew, because we just got to look at statistics, right? Nobody wants right. to get divorced, mm-hmm. but everybody seems to be at the mercy of separation or divorce at some point in their committed relationship. Mm-hmm. So if you talk about how it'll go, how do we protect each other when we're assholes? Like worst case scenario, what are your nevers, right? Mm-hmm. For me, a, a, a never isn't if you cheat. Like I don't believe in that, right? So that's not one of my, what is it called? Your non-negotiables? Non-negotiables. Oh, so, right. so for you, cheating is not a non-negotiable? If it's not cheating, if we talk about it, like if my wife has an attraction to somebody, let's talk it through. Yeah. To me, the hard part about cheating is when people don't communicate. Right, when it feels like complete right. betrayal. Right, and my ex-wife, I communicated to her. I said, I'm gonna fall in love with somebody. I'm miserable, I hate being here. And we didn't do anything about yeah. it. So I could have communicated a lot better and been clearer and more something that I wasn't able to. Mm-hmm. But also you have to hear what people say to you. Yeah. And I think that sometimes when we're in love, we don't hear the other person and what they're saying to us. You know, like for my ex- the non-negotiable was cheating. But for me, a non-negotiable is if I'm telling you something and you don't hear me, if I feel like I'm not heard, that's a non-negotiable. We can't work Mm -hmm. if we don't hear each other. Right. Totally. I want to know what's going to happen with that sperm. So are you guys going to like split the sperm up and each try? Oh, so the sperm is in my name. Oh, so I have access to it. And my wife, um, Erin, we want to have a kid. That's exciting. It's exciting. It's also terrifying because I'm so close to 50. But I had this dream a long time ago. I wanted to live the white American dream, right? (laughs) I love that it's the white American dream. It is the white American dream. Because it is the only dream that was ever fed to us. So you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I and I make jokes because I'm like, well, damn, this is pretty much it. I'll be close to 50 with a new family. And I'm like, this is what white guys have been this doing. Is it. So I'm winning. You I'm are. winning. I'm doing it. You're living that two way. kids by two different mamas. That's it. <laughs> I am officially getting equity. Yes. I get to be divorced mm-hmm. because that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting to have the same problems as everybody else and let them just be the problems and not it's a gay marriage. Right. It's a gay baby. It's a gay divorce. It's just... It's a marriage. It's a divorce. It's a marriage. And it's a person who's about to be 50 in two years who's going to try to have another baby with their younger wife. And, you know, I'll be that older person in the park pushing a stroller. That is so exciting. (laughs) I can't wait for you guys to get pregnant. (laughs) I mean... I'm so excited. It's exciting. It's also like, yo, I'm older. Yeah. My body feels different. You don't get up as easily anymore. Nope. Yeah. Sometimes I just sit there on the floor <laughs> and I'm playing with stuff and I'm like, I'm just going to sit here for a while and I'm a lady here and I'm going to get up eventually. <laughs> but I remember my ex-wife and I, we would look at couples who had one kid and they were still like kind of mm-hmm. like clean and jitty and like, hey, we just take the kid around. Mm-hmm. And then we, we would watch kid people with two or more. And there was just this like defeat. Yeah, it's literally, you see it, you can see it in their bodies. Like there's just a little bit. I was, I was on my way yesterday. To, it was a Sunday. I'm on my way going down the street. And I just, I just, I just started noticing all these moms walking with their multiple children in a stroller. And the way they all were walking was so dejected. Like it's Sunday. It's Sunday. And I'm schlepping you to yet another place. Like I just saw like the tiredness in all of these parents. And then I had the realization, why is it, why is it only moms? Wait, husbands, where the hell are you? Step it up. Take the kids on Sunday. And that's, I yeah. don't know. 
that's me being, I, I should take it easy because I know there's good husbands out there and I know there's good dads out there, especially in our queer families. We're doing it all. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah. you just. But the majority has always been, it's been on, you know, women and female identified folks. And then I keep, I, my fear about having another kid is my son, not sick. I think he had three colds. Oh yeah. Not good. He got, we all got COVID. He had no symptoms. Yeah. You know, we got the easy version of it twice. Thank God. Yeah. Um, so he's been the healthiest kid. He's been the easiest kid. So here's my fear. Okay, I'm looking around like, <laughs> <laughs> is that, do you get two good kids? Isn't there always uh, one that's a challenge? Because, yes. I mean, I was the good kid. I'm not saying anything further. I do have a sibling <laughs> that is my same. mother's other child. Me, same. <laughs> but, no, some people get all good kids. and I And I look at those people. And I get very angry on the inside because I didn't get that. I didn't, I didn't get all good kids. I got our daughter came out a force to be reckoned with and is continuing to be so. So, of course, it's a lot. There's a lot. And my son yeah. started out super simple and easy. And I was like, we got a good one. We got an easy one. We got an easy one. <laughs> he has turned into such a little a hole. I'm sorry, you guys. I love my kids to death, but absolutely. Oh, my God goodness this child is driving me crazy i love him i love him to death but he's gotten a little difficult lately so no i don't think i got a single easy one i didn't well now it's clicking in because what my son gives me he could be an asshole now which is new because oh. he's been the sweetest most cherubic kid yeah. and he's doing things i think i told you he said ma i don't think you understand you were born in the 1900s <laughs> And I lost my mind because what the one? fuck? What the fuck? I was is born right? in the 1900s. Oh it's like 1910, 1950 even, right? But we were born in the 1900s, E. And that's a thing because there are grownups. Grownups. Who were not born in the 19. What is that? That's a whole concept I that I am not prepared for. And I'm not, oh, re I'm not ready for it. I'm not ready for that. Yeah. You were and born in the 1900s. And they look at us like people. Oh my God. Yeah, they, he looks at me like I was born in another century. And I literally, I know I was, but. <laughs> we were. <gasps> we, I, I know, but it's not like that. It's, it's not, not like another like century that. like that. So, we're, listen. <laughs> I only spent 26 years in that other century. Exactly. I'm spending a lot more time in this one. So, he's an asshole about stuff oh, like that. That's and hilarious. He's, though. he's smart. That's smart. So that is super smart. <laughs> he does asshole things with smartness. He's playing on my memory mm, now uh -oh. because my memory is getting shaky. Yeah. And he's like, remember, you said bedtime was 1030 because I did X, Y, and Z. And I was like, I know I didn't say 1030. I had to say 10. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> he said, of course, mom. And I'm like, I don't know if I said 1030. <laughs> so he's playing on me like that. So I have to start writing stuff down <laughs> and tracking myself because he's like, you said I wouldn't have to do dishes this month because of, and, and I'm always making deals. you're going to question yourself. Yeah. I got to stop questioning it. Yeah. No, you need to just keep writing it down because you need proof. I have to keep writing it. I need proof. But I feel like an, I'm always an attorney with this kid. I have to like, <laughs> but I love it too because he's so quick. Yeah. And he gives me me in a male experience, mm. which is deep. It's just like, oh, this is, he, I'm watching male privilege. Right. And I didn't do it on purpose. Like, I haven't been pushing this male agenda no, on him. of course not. But he's very masculine. And he mansplains already. <gasps> and I'm, I'm on him. I'm like, don't talk to me or women or anybody like this. You can't talk to people like they're dumb. Right, right. You can't be condescending. And then I realized, like, my whole life, people have been telling me, E, you know, you're condescending. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> like, he just got aware that he's like, you know, we do have DNA in common, Ma. So, of course, we're going to say the same thing. And then he stopped for a minute. He was like, Huh, we no, don't really we have don't, DNA do in common, do we? And that was a moment for me that was like a little heartbreaking because he's always thought we look alike and we do mm -hmm. literally look alike. Yeah, yeah. But um, he just started to understand that we're not biologically connected. Wow. And that hurt my feelings. Yeah. I was like, but, oh. But also, isn't it kind of beautiful that he was, that it took a lot of realizing for him to be like, oh, wait, wait, because he thinks so so much that you're his biological parent like he feels that connected to you that it took a serious like step back and real contemplation to to realize oh wait a second technically we're not but i don't think that changes anything it didn't no and it's because they teach him too much at school school is the enemy 
school starts teaching them about DNA and about osmosis mm. and trees and shit, they got to stop going to school. Stop <laughs> sending the kids to school. Uh-oh. School gives them fodder to come back and attack you with. <laughs> so no more school. No more school. That's it. They, the, all we can do is be open and honest and uh, have an open line of communication about this with our kids because, you know, they're going to realize that at some point they're going to be out in the world and realize, oh, I'm a little, I'm other, I'm other than, than, than the mainstream families yeah. out there. And hopefully if we're doing this right, they're okay with it. And they actually feel empowered by it. That's my hope. Yeah. We could talk for hours, E. Hours. And we will. We will. We will. Because I think you're going to come back. I hope so. You're coming back. If you'll e. have me, I'm coming you back. Come back, E. You're going to help me close out the season. We're going to do this. All right. Let's knock this season out. We're going to have so many more conversations. I look forward to it. <sighs> I love E. Don't you love E? I love E. That was fun. I am super excited. E is coming back to do some guest hosting with me to help me finish out this season. We've already recorded a couple episodes and they're great. And I can't wait to share them with you. Um, And I can't wait for E to start that baby making process. (laughs) That'll be fun. And I hope and I hope E does it on the show and talks about it a lot. That will be fun. (laughs) Um, But also, I, I have to say a huge, huge thank you to our Patreon members for making this show possible. And we have a lot of new Patreon members. You guys are really showing up. You guys are really showing up for these ovaries. And so I need to say a special thank you to our newest Patreon members. I hope I don't butcher your names. I'm going to do my best. We have Sarah Goodfellow. Thank you, Sarah. Jasmine Stokely. I think I butchered that terribly. But thank you, Jasmine, for showing up and being here. You rock. Brittany Brafford. I think I got that one right. I'm very proud of myself. Valeri Fournier. I, I'm not sure if I said that right at all, but there is an accent over the E, so I think I, I handled that all right. Valeri, that's pretty. And Elizabeth, thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys. We could not do this without you. It means the world. And if you want to help make this content for LGBTQ families, because it's not stopping, like a train that's never going to stop running, you can also join our Patreon community and you can do just that. You're going to do a good thing and you're going to get bonus content. And at the gestational carrier level, you're going to get video interviews of most episodes, which is fun to watch. According to my mom, she prefers the videos because she likes to see people's faces. (laughs) So you might be like Mama Sue and want the videos. And those get dropped a day early. So you're in the know before everybody else. So what you're going to want to do is head to patreon.com slash ovaries talk to join. And that is basically it. You know where I'm at. I'm all over the social media. You can find me on Ovaries Talk on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If these ovaries could talk on YouTube. And of course, support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash ovaries talk. That's where you're going to get the bonus content. Thank you to our sponsor, BetterHelp. And all of you, all of you who are sticking with this and sticking through this transition and sending me emails and sending me DMs and letting me know that this content matters to you. Every single one of your messages means the world to me. And I thank you for that. And now, without further ado, I will say, eggs. I'm doing it, Helen. I'm doing it. Oh, God, Helen. Ovaries. Helen is not real. I don't have an assistant. I'm all by myself. If these uh, uh, ovaries could talk, they would say, X ovaries out.